eight outdoor enclosures. Then we've got a, a big, massive greenhouse with all of our European species of lizard. And then we've got a massive turtle pond full of, well, it's like, what is this? Too many. Too many to turtles. The sheep in Britain, just sheep alone, the grazing impact of sheep from the Roman era onwards have had more impact on wildlife and our environment than all of the industry ever wow. in Britain. Can we dial back to the blue frogs? How, how, yeah. what, what's, why do they go blue? I think it's the males, right? Yeah, um, but what it is, it's a buildup of lymph in the, I think it's in the blood, I think it's in the blood. And basically that gives the superficial appearance of them being blue. Um, so elk in the UK are moose and uh, moose obviously in Canada and America are moose and elk, elk are your red deer, you don't have red deer but the closest thing that there is to red deer is elk in Canada and America. Um, so I've completely forgotten <laughs> the point that I was originally making. Confuse me there. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. This is episode number 101, and thank you so much for tuning in today. So today we have a repeat guest. That is Tom Whitehurst and Harvey Tweets from Celtic Reptile and Amphibian. If you remember, we had them on about a year ago now. I believe it was last summer of 2020, maybe July or so. And in that episode, we discussed their breeding project, specifically how they set up their outdoor enclosures. Harvey and Tom both specialize in outdoor keeping. And in that conversation, they alluded to a facility that they had on the horizon that would allow them to ramp up their local breeding or their, their captive breeding of local species, specifically reptiles and amphibians, with a, hopes of eventually being involved in conservation projects. So Harvey and Tom bring us up to speed of where their facility is at right now. It is amazing how much work they've done in the year. The facility is complete. Well, I'm sure it's not complete. I'm sure they always feel like there's more to be done at the facility, but it is open and operating at pretty much full capacity. They also walk us through their incredible amount of media exposure they've had this year. They really blew up within the last year. You will quickly forget that the two guests today are only 18 years old. They've only just graduated high school, which is it's just incredible. and sort of makes you feel bad almost, like the amount of stuff that they've done in the last year is really incredible. So they walk us through where they are right now. We talk about conservation on more of a slightly deeper level, the concept of rewilding, what it means to rewild, and sort of the steps that have to take place for that to to be considered and we also talk about biosecurity that is something that I think as indoor keepers we don't often think about well we do think about biosecurity but we don't take it the next step where thinking about our animals and how they can impact the wild habitat around so they talk about how they protect not only their animals from disease but also how they protect the native wildlife in their local setting from their facility spreading out into the, the the wildlife so it is really a fascinating conversation and i know you guys will enjoy it before we jump into the chat let's run through our housekeeping if you are looking for any more information on the podcast head to animals at home network.com there you'll find the show notes for everything that you need if you are interested in picking yourself up a shirt or a sweater make sure you head to animals at home.ca slash shop if you would like to join us on patreon head to patreon.com slash animals at home there you have early access to episodes as well as the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests and we do also do a monthly or every six weeks or so a zoom hangout with my friend over at reptiles and research that's liam we do a fun little hangout there on zoom with the listeners and his viewers as well and that's a lot of fun so if you want to interact with myself or the podcast on a deeper level that is the place to do it and finally, thank you so much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for the best reptile enclosures in the business and probably the fastest growing reptile enclosure business that is, we've seen in the reptile hobby, make sure you go check them out. There are links in the YouTube description as well as the show notes. Those are affiliate links. So if you do make a purchase, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, I use that money to help support myself as well as the show. Let's jump into the episode. Enjoy. Well, Harvey and Tom, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having us back on. Yeah, thank you. It was very fun last time, so hopefully we have just as much fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's almost been exactly a year. It's been just over a year. I was looking at my calendar. I think I think we recorded July 8th 
last year. So by the time people listen to this, it'll be a little bit later than that, but we're pretty close to being a year. So you guys have had an, it's sort of an insane year the last 12 months. You guys have done a lot. So I definitely want to hear all about that and updates on the facility and whatnot. But I thought first, maybe we could start with that new legislation that you guys had made a post about a couple, maybe like a month ago now, and uh, just bring everybody up to speed with that. And then we'll jump into things. So maybe if one of you wants to just jump into what is happening in the UK right now. So basically, there's a a Joint Nature Conservation Council, which is a body which advises the government on new legislation on the way we protect and conserve nature through law. And they've done a a recent review. I think they do it every three years or maybe five years. And in this current review, they basically downlisted all of the reptile species, bar the incredibly endangered ones. Now, this is really quite dangerous because all reptile species in the UK in such a nature depleted country are in decline and it's such a backward step in terms of herpetological conservation in general and obviously we come from a standpoint of reintroduction and captive breeding which is adding things to the wild but you can't have just that approach of restoration without the conservation of, of species and habitats. So we did raise a bit of awareness for this. We got about 10,000 views over all platforms, Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. Um, And there is a petition now. So hopefully we can turn the tide and make sure that this legislation does not pass. Um, It's it's, it's just very scary in the current climate of extinction and and, um, climate change. it's, it's, It's quite, quite scary. So something needs to be done. So why would they do that to begin with? Like, what was the, what would be the impetus to drop them down to a, a lower tier of protection? Mainly because um, in the UK we're an incredibly crowded country, and we're always needing more housing. And basically, as uh, to put it bluntly, well, it's not not officially the reason why they're no, doing it, but this is what we kind of to put it deduced. bluntly. Your construction and development companies are in government. You know, government, uh, uh, different members of parliament and things do, uh, you know, have sort of alliances with construction companies and things. So a lot of these reptiles, because they're protected, would require an ecologist to go and translocate the animals or catch them or stop construction completely. So if you can do away with these protection measures, then, you know, construction companies, etc., can really rub their hands in money so that's kind of the main reason why um and it's quite sad to think that you know industry can have an impact on what on wildlife conservation through law is the petition still available for people to sign i'm pretty sure yeah i believe it is yeah we can i'm sure you'll be able to link it somehow yeah yeah you can you guys can send me the link and i'll make sure it's in the show notes i'm not sure by the time this comes out maybe it will not be available but just in case it is i think it's always nice to have a couple extra signatures on there and i think you know a a huge part or a portion of proportion of the listenership for the podcast is north american most of them are american and i think for americans and canadians as well we don't quite have the same grasp of destruction of nature that has happened in England like in in Canada it there's just so much wilderness still it's you know the, the nearest city is a five-hour drive for me I have to drive right through you know a forest basically to get there and I, I think it's very different in 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 England can, can one of you sort of break down how much of the native habitats are left and what animals have been lost along the way not just reptile animals but I, you know reptiles but I know there's been some amazing mammals as well that are pretty much depleted from from England so sorry to keep yeah, answering I mean, every question. I'll, I'll be news the, the <laughs> figures on these. I think um, basically Canada. I, I, I would estimate. Now I don't know, Dylan, but I would estimate you've got about a seventy percent wilderness cover uh, percentage of land area. I would imagine. I'm guessing. I don't know the actual figure. In Britain, that is zero. We don't have any wilderness. There's no intact habitats left where all of the species that reside within that native ecosystem are still there. There are some tiny areas in Scotland of what's known as Caledonian forest, and this is a very rare habitat full of pine woods. It's exactly very similar to the boreal forest you have in Canada. And that has been basically cut down to only about 30 small fragments, 
about 30,000 acres in size, 30 to 40,000 acres in size. That is our last wilderness. And even still, it's missing all of the large mammals, all the large carnivores. Many of the bird species, some of the reptile and amphibian species, a really incredibly depleted habitat. What you've had happen in Britain over the past 10,000 years is a just continual, non-stopping, driven extinction of so many species because of man. The first animals to go were obviously the megafauna, the woolly rhinos, the woolly mammoths, etc, etc. And as time went on and we came into the Holocene, that's when other species went extinct, like the bison, the aurochs, the wild boar. All of these animals literally killed and we've got fossil evidence to show that. But more recently, animals like the brown bear, which you've got a lot of in Canada, and if you ever have any spare, Dylan, please send them over our way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, also the beaver. Now, the beaver, luckily, has been reintroduced, and, and I actually worked on some of the reintroductions of that species and was very privileged to do so. But I'm only... 18 years old and it's only been sort of reintroduced in the last 10 years so it just shows you how sort of how this rewilding movement that we're part of is only just starting to pick up pace the most recent extinction of a large mammal though was the wolf and this potentially lived into the 19th century in scotland and um, it's an incredible shame because repeatedly ever since we could you know ever since we identified wolves as a threat since civilization began in Britain, we killed them. It, horrendous torture techniques like chopping off their jaws and then releasing them so they'd starve to death, burning pits where uh, the female wolf and, and her cubs would live, letting them burn alive. Absolutely horrendous way of treating an animal. And unfortunately, wolves went extinct and nearly sort of, if you think 19th century, that's only about 200 years ago, nearly clung on. And you're so lucky in Canada that you've got actually got too many wolves as it is. <laughs> They're infringing on, yeah, on civilization yeah. and population centers. But, you know, it's a real shame because this is an animal which doesn't kill people. Rabid wolves do and sometimes tame wolves do. But wild, pure wild wolves don't attack people. And on top of that, this is an animal which regulates the whole ecosystem and creates a healthy functioning landscape. And it's a shame we've lost it, but hopefully one day, hopefully before I die, we can bring them back. But the problem with Britain is we've got, a, as I say, no wilderness left, but also the fact that we farm so much of it and so many people, there's so many people in such a small area. That doesn't mean it can't be done. Places like the Netherlands have already got wolves back and bison and all sorts of amazing species and they've got an even, even denser population than the UK. So hopefully one day we can see see a wilder Britain. It would be absolutely incredible. Yeah, that is pretty amazing. So I, th I think we'll this is a good starting point for what you guys are up to. And we'll get into the rewilding a little bit later because I know that's, as you said, this is some projects that you guys are working on as well. So Tom, maybe you could bring us up to speed. For, I think last time we had you on the podcast, I don't think you even had the land that you guys currently have, or maybe you were just sort of working it out. So I think everything was in, maybe it was a Tom's backyard, all your, all your setups, outdoor setups. And so that was, a, seems like a, an eternity ago. So maybe you could bring us up to speed. Where are you guys? What is the facility you have now? How big is it? And what sort of projects are you working on? So yeah, so basically last year when we were on the podcast, it was my garden and Harvey's garden. And that was it basically. That was all of our enclosures, all of our animals were kept there. And it was just really hard to manage at a level where we needed to, to have an impact with rewilding. So basically we've acquired funding. This was in, well, it was last autumn, acquired funding and, and we were able to find a piece of land which we deemed quite um, perfect and ideal for, for what we're doing. So it's a place with lots of sunlight, but also some trees to shade throughout the day, which is important for a lot of um the, the native species because it can get a bit too hot, especially in a greenhouse for them. And we moved over all, well not all animals, most of our animals in March. So now we're in, well, August now. So we've had a few, few good months of all the animals being on the facility and working with them closely. But work began in, I believe it was September, October time. Yeah. And it was absolutely terrible weather. <laughs> We, we were literally, it was pouring rain every single day. It was bad for British standards, I'll say that. 
and um, it was really hard work because when you when you dig in ponds and cutting pieces of wood and putting together enclosures, it's hard at the best of times. But when you're doing it in thick mud and it's just wind we, and we've dug oh, enough soil to last a lifetime. Oh, yeah. We've we've just dug and dug and dug. We mu- <laughs> you're talking about we must have shifted maybe 30 tonnes of soil, something absolutely yeah. bonkers, even, maybe even more than that, wow. even, by hand. Yeah, you we've know. even had to order in more soil for our enclosures yeah. as well on top of that. So it's uh, it's been a big a big job, but, you know, me and Harvey at the time, last autumn, we were still in school, we finished now, but we were still in school, but we are in lockdowns, obviously, so we weren't in school, we were doing it from home, which has actually made life a lot easier for Celtic because... We were able to spend a lot more of our free time down at the site instead of being stuck at school, um, which was ideal. So we got the man hours in there and over the winter, it transformed really from this derelict site into some something that we can be proud of really. Yeah. And, and, and say that we have a facility and we've got all these amazing biosecurity measures in place so that disease can't get in or out of the facility. It's, it's just a top-notch place for keeping reptiles and amphibians. And when we first had the idea, it was, it was more of like a, um, a dream as opposed to a reality. Because obviously it costs money to do this. And us being 18, well now 18, but at the time we were 16, thinking about this whole project, it was just, just, it was just imagination really. It wasn't anything that we actually thought would happen. And obviously, with us acquiring funding, that's made that possible. And yeah, it's just it's it's been an amazing journey so far. Incredible, really. Yeah, yeah. it's been bonkers that we've done so much in so little time. Um, and just to put a little plug in there now, just want to thank everyone who's been involved, from family members to people like you, Dylan and and uh, Liam and and Joe, for just advising. It's been absolutely amazing the amount of support we've got. Um, and uh, and yeah, just thank you to if anyone's listening who's helped. Thank you so much. It's it's been amazing, and uh, it, it's just been amazing. Well, it's it, it, I'm kind of tearing up as I say it in a way, but it is kind of like it, it it's what I feel born to do, and it's a dream come true. And every single day I wake up excited to get back to work, and uh, you know I don't think many people can say that, but I can. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. I mean, I think anybody who's had a hand in helping is has it's been a pleasure to do it. If I could probably speak for everybody, because you can see both of their passions that you the passion that both of you have, and and it's so true. I mean, I remember last, I guess it was maybe last winter, you guys were starting to turn soil, and even though I had faith in you guys, I knew that you guys were going to make something amazing. It was like a mud pit there, yeah. just <laughs> digging through dirt, and it's just like piles of just sopping wet. And you, for me, who didn't have the whole vision in my mind, I'm like, I wonder how this is going to turn out. And now when I see it, it's just it literally looks like a professional facility. You guys have several enclosures, and maybe you, I get one of you to walk through how, what how many enclosures you have, and then there's also some big greenhouses as well that you guys have constructed. So maybe you could run through whoever wants to take it what how many enclosures roughly you have and sort of what species that you guys are working with for those of you that didn't listen to the first episode they may not be familiar with exactly what type of reptiles and amphibians you have there so i just counted quickly in my head we have eight like um permanent outdoor enclosures that are built out of wood mesh um and polycarbonate sheeting which stops the animals scaling and getting out um it, it went through a few phases so we started off with the original ideas for the outdoor enclosures and we basically developed as we went along realised that maybe we don't need this size of a, sleep, a railway sleeper to build the base on or maybe we don't need to use this mesh because it's not strong enough so it was an evolution um, it, wasn't, it was planned before we, we started building but it wasn't like a detailed specific plan because obviously We've never done anything like this before, and there's no manual out there that says how to build a facility for reptiles and amphibians. So we, we we definitely learned as we went along. So we've got eight eight outdoor enclosures. Then we've got a a big massive greenhouse with all of our European species of lizard, who who basically need a much warmer climate than in the UK, much more steady climate, I should say. 
um, not necessarily warmer in summer our, our summers can be quite nice and warm, warm but in spring and winter it drops down a bit too low for, for a lot of the species and then we've got a massive turtle pond full of well, it's like what, 30. 30. too many, too many t- turtles. We've overstocked the pond, but that's because we've now uh, built a new pond that the turtles are ready to move into. So we've got three ponds all together, two of which are for turtles and another which is for frogs. Um, and basically, the turtles are one of our key species that we're trying to breed. Um, we have two species, the Caspian and the European pond turtle. Um, and they're absolutely awesome little things, amazing little animals. Um, and then on top of that, we've got our own infrastructure, like um, we've got our own office and hatchery space. Um, we've got our own kitchen, uh, lacerted raising area, um, sheds, biosecurity stuff, sinks, whatever, you know, boring stuff. Uh, but everything that goes along with breeding and looking after animals. And that is a, a point that should be made is a lot of our time, the majority of our time was actually spent building stuff which is kind of unrelated to animals. So paths, moving offices, building security fences, um, stuff that you wouldn't, you know, it's got nothing to do with, with animals, but it needs to be there to make an establishment. So, um, yeah, it's not pure animal work and it definitely wasn't in the winter, but it was bloody good fun at oh, some yeah. points, you know, yeah. really good fun. Um, and um, we... Basically, the the whole idea is as you walk down through the facility, you go from outdoor to pond to indoor on this sort of temperature gradient whereby the first enclosures are animals which are native to the UK and can live in open air, as you might want to call it, open-topped enclosures, no external uh, way of heating them. Then you go to a pond which is in a bit more of a warmer place because it's surrounded by quite high wood walls and those wood walls keep the heat in and stop breezes so it makes a warmer microclimate and then you go into the greenhouse which is mediterranean like temperatures Um, and all of it has been built with expert consultation we've got people who've worked in zoos we've got people who run their own private captive breeding situations outdoor keepers all sorts of different people from professional to private to novice every you know lots of input because it's exactly what you need you need to cross check and get opinions on when you're doing a project of this size, you know. But there was an element of sort of like, um, make it up as you go, you know. And that's what Tom said, evolving the way we design enclosures and stuff. And there is stuff we've done and built that we'd go, we wouldn't do it in that way, any, you know, the next time around or whatever. Yeah, I'm sure. Always learning. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's lots of things we're doing now <laughs> that we wouldn't do in a year's time. But like I say, it's um, it's an ongoing project. We've... We originally set a date, didn't we? It was like March the 1st or something. Oh, yeah. And we were like, oh, it's going to be all brand new and all finished by then. And then we can open it and it'll be amazing. March 1st came and we were halfway. halfway yeah. There. <laughs> not because we had... Not because we weren't working hard, but because we underestimated... We were working harder than what we yeah, thought we'd work. Yeah, we, you know? we underestimated how much you actually needed to do in order to <laughs> make it happen. Because it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't just enclosures, it was everything, the whole the whole deal. Like, making it secure, getting electricity and water to the site. It's just things like that that you never really think that you need to raise reptiles and amphibians, but then you do. Well, it's definitely easy to forget that you guys are only 18. Like, I can't imagine what the next five years is going to look like. It's crazy how much you have accomplished. We peaked too soon, Dylan. It's only what? downhill now, I bet. You know, we peaked way too You've already peaked. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with an early peak. So it, as far, I'm, I'm just curious about, like, your your office and the indoor space. How did you – is that, like, a small trailer, or what are you guys using for that? I'm sure you didn't erect something from scratch, or did you? So it's basically a shipping container, and it's basically okay. been converted into this part viv room, part raising area, part feeding station – part kitchen, part lacerted raising rack. So it's all kind of all in one sort of Oh, it's very cramped. Thing. Yeah, very it's cramped. cramped. There's, no, there's no space we should have for living. Bigger, really, yeah, but, there's no space know. for living. Uh, it's all for the animals. Uh, but it's got, it, it, it's, it, you need an indoor space, even with outdoor keeping, to keep, you know, feeder insects, to store stuff, to make a cup of tea, you know, because obviously we're British, we drink a million cups of tea a day. Um, <laughs> it goes without saying. To do admin, whatever, you know, 
because not let's not forget we've refined since we last spoke to you we've refined the technique of indoor keeping uh, sorry of outdoor keeping to the point where we do use elements of indoor keeping so at some stages in animals um year, yearly cycles they're brought indoors we're actually going to artificially brumate uh, uh, parts of the animals as opposed to letting them naturally hibernate just because we've learned mistakes of you know the past whereby let's say eggs haven't hatched in time because the animal wasn't given a warm enough head start or whatever to the year and we've learned these these sort of mistakes now and are able to refine a technique um, and that's what it's all about captive breeding as you know it's it's, it's got to be science led and it's got to be we've got to learn from the mistakes of the past and learn you know, how do we actually advance the way that we keep these species? Because at the end of the day, if it's all good for that species, it's all good for conservation. If it's all good for conservation, it's it's all good for all living things. So that's the way we've got to think about it from a conservation yeah. standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. There's definitely an element of control that you want to add back in when you're doing it that way. How are you guys controlling the temperature of the greenhouse? Is that just done through windows and opening things? Or is that is there some sort of external cool or heating system there? So um, we have these like windows that basically open when it gets too hot, um, but it also it doesn't regulate it enough. Uh, sometimes the greenhouse just gets too hot, so we have to take panels out of the back to just let air come through and circulate and cool it down. Sometimes, but um, you know when it's like it is today, at, at a high of twenty degrees, it's not too bad because in the greenhouse it's maybe thirty five degrees which is ideal you know it's perfect for a lot of these european mediterranean species so you don't have to do too much and if they ever get too hot they they bury down and, and go in the shade themselves they know what to do like it's it's completely natural for them and obviously we're spraying them down with water and that every day keeping them nice and hydrated and cool and we've we've had great success in the greenhouse i mean we've we've had lots of eggs this year from the animals in the greenhouse so we know it's it's doing wonders it's just that scaling it up now and seeing if next year we can increase how many eggs we get um, which we, we hope we will because you know the, some of the animals have been put in during the summer so they haven't had that long to sort of acqu acclimate mm. to to their surroundings so i think next summer we definitely do better once they're used to the environment that they're in yeah yeah and how how much time are you each of you spending there a day is this like do you, I, i'm sure you have to be there every day is it a, a massive commitment every day yeah so it's it, one of us is there every single day at least one of us um and then on top of that it's basically we do about four days of full-on work i'd say a week so that's where that is literally 9 a.m. till 12 at night work. Stop stop to eat and stop for a breather now and then throughout the day. But well, it's, it's not all like manual labour. No. Um, a lot lot of the work... It's been getting less and less than yeah, manual labour, yeah. obviously, as, as the facility's been built. But as we've, we've discovered, a lot of work is now admin and replying to emails and having a presence on social media and creating YouTube videos and that and it takes up a lot of time but it's definitely worth doing that um, it's taken up more time than we the, we initially mm. imagined that's why our series isn't every week as we as we every initially month. planned <laughs> it's every month pretty much now yeah but we're just trying to get content out as much as we can and, and if it, that come with the with the series and that that comes with the fact that we didn't finish for March the first or whenever, yeah. so we were still building as we're trying to film and it it was a bloody nightmare. Well, when when there's only two of us and you need to carry something heavy and you want to film it and you put it on a tripod and then the tripod falls over because it's too muddy and the wind's blowing, it's like it's like forget it, we'll just build it and then yeah. show it afterwards. So it, it wasn't ideal, but I mean you got to do what you got to do. I mean. Yeah. I've done that so many times where I start a project. I'm like, I'm going to film this. I'm going to make a video. And then you get like a quarter of the way through and you're like, you know what? They don't need to see this. <laughs> I'll just do it. I'll just do it. Cause it just, it does add so much time, you know, setting the tripod up, doing this. It just, it really does add a lot of time. So 
I, I want to circle back to all the offspring and the babies that you guys are producing in a second. But before we do that, you've also had, a, I think one of the reasons you guys have had so much success in the last year or so is the amount of media exposure you had. Sort of a crazy amount. All of a sudden you went from zero to a hundred. How, how did that start? You've, I mean, there's been some BBC stuff. Nigel Marvin had come check uh, to check out your facility. There's all these amazing things. So how did that begin? So we obviously acquired... We, we formed the company in September is September last year that is when we officially became a limited company and then um, we obviously acquired funding in sort of November time and then we sort of building in November um, and basically with that a friend of mine shout out to Pete Cooper uh, all time friend massive like we couldn't be do what we do without Pete's uh, as part time zookeeper part time reintroduction specialist part-time friend as well he's just an all, all right <laughs> part-time <guy>. friend <laughs> you have to pay him and, uh, yeah. and sometimes he's not your friend <laughs> <laughs> and uh, basically he said um i, I know patrick barkham now patrick barkham is a guardian col- columnist he does the environment for, for the guardian uh, and he said i'm sure he'd be interested in what you're doing so i literally said hey patrick this is who we are I sent a what's it of our site and didn't really think much of it and Patrick got back and said this this looks absolutely incredible um I, we'd love to do a long story on you which is like 4,000 words or something um and so we were like amazing and we did an interview and it lasted for about three hours and we talked about all sorts of different things um to then find the next couple of weeks later or a week later we had this really long sort of thing yeah, about we, us. we we thought it would be you know just like a half a page yeah. thing or something like that but then it was double double yeah. page spread and, it, wasn't and the it? amazing the crazy thing as well and this i think this is added to a bit of the success of us as well the article didn't just talk about reptiles it also talked about our love life how we built the facility friends and family like quite personal stuff that we weren't kind of used to in effect but what that did was inadvertently create two characters in a way that represented yeah. Celtic reptile and amphibian and I think that was the massive draw the fact that we were teenagers we were characters and we were just we were just like everyday people who have done something you know that, that not everyday people do and with that it was just like a match to petrol I just think that the media just absolutely loved it it didn't come without controversy and without discussion and without me getting I mean anxiety attacks and whatever da 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 but was it worth it and was it fun, you know, massively? And we're still reaping the benefits today. We filmed stuff with, um, I don't even know how to say this, but BBC America we've done. So we've gone global in effect. Um, and we've got lots of other projects lined up throughout the year. And it, it's it's just been absolutely phenomenal. And I've said to like my friends, I've said, you know, it's just been, I've just, it's been amazing luck that this has happened. And, and the response back has been, no, it's not been luck. You've worked so hard and you deserve it. And that was, you know, it's been very nice to get that response pretty much from everyone. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, but not just from a business point of view, but from a personal point of view, it, it's crazy because this last six months, I've met so many, you know, different people from the media, from conservation from all walks of life who've united around this common goal about rewilding and restoration. And there's something, you know, there's an element of hope in that. There's something that brings, you know, the thought that, you know what, people are amazing. And when we do put our mind to a problem and when we do genuinely get our priorities straight, people are incredible. And this, the, the genuinely is sort of a hopeful thing within that. So overall, it's just been absolutely incredible. And, you know, I'm not the same person today as I am a year ago on that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it is really amazing. And, you know, the people who work the hardest somehow generate the most luck. I think that's <laughs> a, a coincidence. It's just the way it is. You know, when you work hard, you get it, it eventually will pay off. And I, I love that story because one of the you know, the environmental movement, environmentalist movement, you can call it, there, there's a big section of it that I really don't like. And it becomes this very anti-human, uh, you know, human mankind is evil and we should just, you know, kill everybody to la- allow mother nature to return. And I, I don't like that sentiment at all because we are here, we're sharing the planet. It's not us that did all of the damage. 
and, and like you said, there, there's this huge positive movement when, when you sh- present that information to people, all of a sudden people are interested in it, they're invested in it and they want to help too. And they, people actually want to see the world get better for the most part. Of course, there are evil people. There are corporations that are willing to turn everything into a desert. That goes without saying, but it's really not everybody. And I, I hate those movements that paint all humans with this evil brush. And I think it's totally unfair. So there's... There's, two, there's a spectrum in, when it goes to environmentalism. If you look at the roots of environmentalism, you go back to sort of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, you know, um, American um, president who came up with, basically saved areas of wilderness and saved species like the American bison. Everyone knows the story. Um, and within that, you had Theodore Roosevelt, who was quite utilitarian in the way that he thought about the environment, as in, we need to preserve resources, we need to preserve land, we need to preserve monuments for the good of the American society and the rest of the world to actually enjoy and make money from. Um, and that's where he came up with the idea of the Boone and Crockett Club, this idea that we use hunting to preserve animals. Um, and that's quite a utilitarian point, whereas more recently in the 1970s, 60s and 70s with Rachel Carson's book, A Silent Spring, that any environmentalist knows, it became more about looking at this and going, wait there, this is more of an ethical issue. Animals shouldn't have to be killed or whatever. And the the, the two sides can clash because the, the side that says that it was anti-human, if you want to say, it says that being utilitarian is not getting to the root of the problem. It's the fact that we look at everything as a resource is why we have an environmental crisis. Whereas the other side says that without us seeing trees as producing oxygen, as beavers slowing the flow of rivers, whatever, then it's just going to get destroyed by the system. You know, there's no moving the system. I think the answer is bang in the middle of those two sentiments. There's an argument that it's the ethical thing to do is to preserve nature. But at the same time, there's a there's a very solid argument that we should be utilitarian about the way that we look at natural processes. So, um, so yeah, and I think if you hit the sweet spot between saying it's the right thing to do to rewild, but at the same time, it has all these benefits, eco-tourism, uh, stopping the next pandemic, which is very topical, uh, slowing the flow of flooding, et cetera, et cetera you really do hit a sweet spot of, of a demographic. At the end of the day, I've said from day one that I'm team person. I'm team people. I, I think that people are amazing. I am a people's person, a very sociable person. Uh, I do love people, or at least, you know, <laughs> the majority of people, shall we say. Um, and the thing is, is that the best thing for people is to have a healthy environment which goes on forever, you know, producing oxygen and looking after us. So, you know, it's in every single person's best interest to have, you know, a functioning ecosystem, a functioning planet. So that's where I stand on, on the matter. I'm both utilitarian and also uh, the other, you know, part of the environment, not anti-human though. Um, and uh, I think if more people took that sentiment, we'd be able to get some real concerted action done. Well, I, I think it, ma- it makes a lot of sense. I mean, th- that way you're demonstrating to people that we do need to have this environment to keep us healthy. And there's maybe a bit of selfishness in that, but th- that's okay. I think it's, there's a lot of weakness in coming at people saying, you're the problem. You're the reason that this has happened. It's like, how how can you expect anyone to jump on your bus if you're basically telling them that you're the worst thing that's ever happened to the earth? Like it, you know, humans have also been the some of the best things that's ever happened. There's been incredible things that have happened with humans too, as well. So I think that's the the right sentiment. So let let's talk about rewilding because this is one of those things where you know, especially in the reptile hobby, as you guys know, I just released a podcast last week that we talked about sometimes, or I shouldn't say sometimes, a lot of times reptile keepers fall into the commercialization for conservation bumper sticker type attitude where it's just like, well, I keep reptiles. That means that I'm doing conservation work and really, no, you're not really doing anything besides keeping pets. So that's okay. But you can't really stand on that mound for too long. And, and, and then, you know, you have the other side where people think, okay, well, you could never rewild anything. Nothing can be actually re-released into nature because there's just way too many red flags that pop up. So why don't we just start with the concept? I think we covered this last time, but, you know, it's been a year. So let's talk about this again. The concept of actually re-releasing animals into the wild. What is that process and how is it possible? So if you want me to talk. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Basically, there's an international practice, which is the IUCN guidelines for reintroduction. Now, put a very, very bold line under guidelines. 
And basically, the IUCN guidelines state how a species reintroduction to, should take place. All of the key factors, a disease, public engagement, science, etc., etc., etc. Uh, and basically, that's standard practice that we would use in carrying out a reintroduction and anyone else on Earth should use. In terms of conservation and commercialization, there is obviously an argument for that, but it is to what point does that argument still stand? Because you could argue that, you know, farming beef helps save the aurochs. By the way, the aurochs is extinct, so there's a bit of irony in that sentiment. Um, so... Yeah, it kind of works up to a point. I mean, if you're breeding rare species like Stefan's doing, which is amazing, then I think that you can obviously there's there's you can obviously make a point there. But keeping leopard geckos well, and things. Well, that's why when we first started, um, our sort of sentiment was breed and conserve, and that's how we sort of promoted ourselves and promoted the idea of captive breeding, and that was only because we had no idea how to take it yeah. to a rewilding yeah. level so that was our sort of goal was to get people captive breeding quite rare species yeah. in the uk a lot of the native species are quite rare in captivity so we thought that was a great idea to sort of get behind and obviously as we've gone through the well through the last two years we've realized that we can actually rewild and that is a, a much bigger well, or at least fit into that yeah, broader yeah. narrative which is sort of, uh, you know, assembling itself in the UK and the rest of the world. Because releasing lizards and snakes and turtles and things and whatever isn't rewilding in itself, but releasing turtles, snakes and lizards onto a, a land management project whereby trees are allowed to regenerate, herbivores are allowed to proliferate, carnivores are reintroduced is part of a rewilding program yeah. so it's hard because you we kind of rewilding but kind of not as well rewilding is seeing the whole ecosystem come back together so the way that it differs between modern conservation in the uk this is in canada it's different you've got a different form of conservation is the fact that in the uk we take an area of habitat as small as a room i'm not even kidding you as small as like a kitchen or a living room, <laughs> tiny, and manage it. And it's managed by people. So people maintain the height of the grass. People maintain how many species of tree are there. People maintain, you know, what sort of butterflies can come into the reserve. It's absolutely bonkers, really, when you think about it in, in the framework of wilderness and how actual ecosystems work. Kid you not, there's a reserve in Wales, right? that manages for a species of weevil that's this big and the heather has to be maintained at a height of something like 24.7 centimeters tall because that's the best for the weevil now <laughs> what you what you see there is is a, is a country which has lost all of its nature and the, the very the few last things are clinging on to these tiny reserves and the big disclaimer is these reserves have helped to save so many rare species but at the point where you're managing the height of the heather for a weevil, you know you've failed in the environmental yeah, movement. Yeah. It gets that bad. Exactly. And the problem is, as well, is you've got this massive establishment within conservation whereby the old boys sit at the top and say no to every single project that maybe offers a glimmer of hope. Why do they say no? Because it's taught. Every introduction is taught in, in, in an ecology course as a bad thing. But the problem is, is that, yes, there are associated risks with a reintroduction like disease. But as I've said time and time again, we're going to get to a point, and we're almost already there in the UK, where no animals will be around to catch diseases because they're all gone. So we've got to do something. And with reintroductions, they're incredibly complex. Don't get me wrong. But so is an iPhone. Yet yeah, everyone has one. So in in basically going through experimentation and using science to inform how to carry out a reintroduction, you are refining that method so that in years' time it becomes basically standard practice for managing nature, which it kind of already is in America and Canada where, you know, America you've reintroduced wolves and uh, black-footed ferrets and bison and, and all sorts. I know you've reintroduced bison. Was it into Banff National Park in Canada, I think? Yeah, yeah, there's then some nature reserves that have them there, yeah. And, you know, amazing things like that. We're actually just starting to reintroduce bison in the UK, which is which is really exciting. 
and hopefully we'll one day we'll get to a, a point where well what i'd love to see is i'd love to see conservation become a trade and what i mean by that is not a trade where like not an animal trade that's not what i mean but become a standard industry whereby you know oh hi, hi i'm a builder oh hi i'm an electrician oh hi i'm a you know nature manager whatever i would love to see that whereby people realize that trees produce oxygen trees sequester carbon trees stop flooding uh, grasslands help sequester car carbon grasslands stop flooding etc etc and realize wait there this is a service on every you know every single day i benefit from so there's this push for the national um, i think it's called the national nature service or something like that we've got the nhs as you probably know in the uk and there's been proposals to put forward a national nature service whereby there are workers who plant trees and whatever. A bit like, a bit more of an evolution on, on the National Park Service that's in the, the US. I don't know what you're like in Canada, but a bit more involved than the National Park Service, which would be amazing to see a standardised unit just for nature conservation. Um, so basically, I, I think environmentalism is really coming to a, a turning point now. We just need to be bolder and we just need to take the plunge and go, you know, let's do something over not do anything. Yeah, yeah. I, I also think that part of the reason why environmentalism hasn't been so trendy as it is now um, over the years is because you look out, well, at least in the UK, you look out your window and you don't see any, any nature, you don't see any animals, you see trees, you see grass, you see sheep. And if you say that you're a conservationist or an environmentalist, people will think, well, that's boring because all you're doing is protecting trees and grass <laughs> and sheep. But Which a lot of the UK yeah, conservation is. movement is about. But if you, you pair know. it up with rewilding, then you can be conserving, like Harvey's mentioned, bison. You can be conserving lynx. You can be conserving reptiles, amphibians, all sorts of different species, different birds. And people will start to think, wait, that's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool job. Imagine working so closely with those species. That'd be pretty cool. Instead of working with grass and trees and sheep, you're working with big mammals and massive birds and rare reptiles. And it's, that I think that is just part of the problem. It's, we've and let the nature go so yeah. far gone that it's now almost boring. People are just bored by it. And when people are bored nothing's going to happen and that works hand in hand as tom says with public engagement you know when pu when the public are interested in you know wow there's a bison you know grazing in a rewilded area what which was a, an ex sheep farm let's say there's just something about that that lights a spark in everyone's soul and reminds us what it means to be human you know, when you see an animal like a bison, a beaver or a wolf or a bear or whatever, it reminds you that other animals, other sentient creatures which have got an incredible impact on the very, you know, ground we stand on exist. And, um, yeah, I think that with rewilding, it offers a new narrative that we can bring back species which have gone. And as I say, as I said at the start of the podcast fundamentally there's something very beautiful and very hopeful in that message and uh, we're so glad that people are latching on to it well yeah i think there is this i mean p people are innately drawn to nature which is just a, such a benefit for the environmental movement because you just show people that and they go wow that is really special and and one thing i want to say just as a side for anyone that is breeding reptiles and thinking that they're doing conservation really if if you're working with a common species let's say i'll just i'll just put this out here just to remind people the best way you can contribute to that is through financial donation you know you're not going to i'm not going to be rewilding leopard geckos but if i'm breeding wild leopard ge or leopard geckos i can maybe take a small profit and donate to it so i'll just say that to anybody who's listening and say hey i thought i was doing conservation and then you know one of the other things i think that you had said harvey that i thought was it's just funny with especially with the sequestering carbon with the green grass and the trees and everything i i find it funny that that message is not more prominent in the ether of, of the world, you know, like instead we're bringing the government's bringing carbon tax to punish me for going to work and I'm paying extra money to just, just so I can pay for my gas to go and keep the economy going. But instead there's no promotion of planting trees in your backyard or having a larger green space to sequester that carbon. Like you sort of see, you know, the real motives behind some of these things. 
Yeah, so just to add a disc sorry, just to go back to the conservation thing as well, to add a disclaimer. Um one of the one of the misconceptions as I say about us and conservation is that it's easy to breed these species and reintroduce them and you can do it on your own. It's not. You need a dedicated facility like we have right. with expert consultation, with money, etc. to do it. So don't, people, although, you know, we are normal people and it's just happened to be that this is the line of work we've gone into, don't get the false impression that it's easy or it's even achievable to do on a you know on it uh, within your own homes or back gardens it's yeah. not so well i mean we we you know. tried it for two years and yeah we, we and that's, haven't yeah, exactly. introduced the species yeah so it's but hopefully now we've got the facility yeah who knows so going back to what you said about carbon there was a very interesting thing that elon musk said recently which was he was going to gift a hundred million pounds to anyone who could come up with an idea of a carbon sequestration technology and thousands of replies on the tweet said well i've just invented a tree and um, <laughs> it's kind of ironic that in in environmentalism you have two trains of thought basically the mainstream one is that we need to innovate our way out of this which is which is fair enough we do need to innovate we need to find better solutions to uh, producing energy uh, we need to find more efficient ways of, of farming etc but at the same time, you've got to have the restoration because only 3% of global ecosystems remain intact. And that was a study done recently. I think it was in June, maybe, the study came out. Um, and so you need to sequester carbon through restoration. And that comes you know, with, with planting trees, reintroducing species, but mainly the number one way of rewilding is setting aside areas. And... Um, a study, I think it was last year, came out at saying that if we uh, saved 30% of nature or rewilded 30% of the world's land surface area, we'd save 70% of all species or something unbelievable. So it's about setting aside areas and not just small areas, big areas, interconnected areas, massive areas on the scale that you have in in Canada with like Banff National Park, etc., uh, the Rockies with, um, what's the, uh, oh, how can I forget the, uh, what's the place called the beautiful valley up, up north? That's very, <laughs> not very specific. In the UK? No, no, in, in Canada. Yeah. Where is it? Uh, Yukon, that's it. Yukon. Oh, the Yukon, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, amazing areas like that. You know, that's what we need on a global scale. Of course, Canada can do more. I mean, I was doing some research into the tar sands. Um, mm -hmm. oil, is it oil extraction there? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's some dodgy business going on there. But overall, you're a million times better than the UK in terms of nature conservation. So kind of keep it up, Canada. And, it uh, must sound more. like we're stating the obvious to you. Yeah. T telling you how to basically... And, turn into Canada exactly and that's another problem that the UK has is we're very very good at telling Africa you need to look after your lions Canada look after your wolves please and your brown bears you know yeah. India look after your tigers yet we can't tolerate species on our own back door and that is basically because of the fact that we're a very zoo zoophobic nation we're actually quite scared of species which is ironic considering as well we're also massive pet lovers in the UK. We're like the number one country for loving pets. More money is donated to animal welfare charities than ever, any other country, I think, in the UK. So it's wow. really, really ironic that these two things happen at the same time. But slowly we are getting there because slowly people realise that, wait there, that this is not as bad as what it seems. 70% of people in a, in a poll said that they'd be happy for beavers to be reintroduced. And 50% even said wolves, you know, we'd be happy to, you know, reintroduce. Considering we left the EU on 52%. You know, uh, people saying yeah. yes and 48% yeah. saying no. I think that, you know, that's pretty good reason to bring back some of our of our large species. Um, I'd love to see moose brought back because uh, moose are just absolutely incredible. Or elk. We call them elk in the UK, although elk in Canada and America are a different thing altogether as well. It's really confusing. So is an elk in the UK more like a, one of our, like a moose? It's the same species, exactly. Oh, it's the same species. Okay. Yeah. Basically, what interesting story. I know this has got nothing to do with reptiles, but... Nah, who cares? <laughs> basically our red deer in the UK are a smaller version of your elk and red deer are in the same genus as, um, as, as elk very similar species elk are just a bit bigger 
But even our red deer are dwarfs compared to the European species because our ecosystems are so damaged. Even red deer can't find enough food to feed themselves. So this miniature version of the animal that they could be. So when British um, people went over to America back in the, the 19th century, people saw these big versions of red deer and, and thought, well, they're a different species. And uh, that's why they called them elk, because they were more in size with the moose that they were familiar with than the red deer. Um, so elk in the UK are moose, and uh, moose, obviously, in Canada and America are moose. And elk elk are your red deer. You don't have red deer, but if the closest thing that there is to red deer is elk in Canada and America. Um, so... I've completely forgotten the point that I was originally <laughs> making. Excuse me, that. Oh, no, I would love to see moose back. Yeah, I'd love to see moose back to the UK. Um, Derek, one of our colleagues, called me an idiot for saying that because they're a very hard species to reintroduce because they need lots of uh, riparian areas because they eat a lot of aquatic vegetation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're also horrendous road incidents. So... Yeah, I was oh, yeah. called, called, an, called an idiot for that one, but I would love to see them back one day. They, they were actually reintroduced to the UK, but into a fence reserve. But unfortunately, they didn't have enough food there. It was only two animals into a massive fenced area. They didn't have enough food there, so the project was terminated, unfortunately. But one day, I would love to see them back. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons that we, especially in the province that I live in, it, we're trying to control the wolf population more. I think if you get a deer tag for hunting, you're allowed to take one female wolf as well with your deer tag to start to allow the moose population to regenerate. We still have lots of moose here, but it's nowhere like it was. I've only, I don't see them very often, maybe like once every few years, but I don't go looking for them, but they are in a, a remarkable species. But so as far as, as you guys are concerned with rewilding, how many steps are there between where you are now before where you think you could actually release animals into the wild? You're talking about, you know, needing these patches of land that need to be, Manage. Do, do those exist? Are those already in the works as far as people are, are actually looking at pieces of land to, to rewild? So we've got projects in the works. A lot of it, though, is, is bureaucracy and also paperwork. So we have to write reports. We have to do habitat suitability analysis, all of this stuff on top of our, you know, or, or, or top of our existing procedures like biosecurity protocols, etc. So basically we're looking at hopefully next year doing some proper uh, on the ground uh, reintroductions can't say what species we can't say it's hard yeah because we have to sign disclosure agreements oh you can't say what species yeah unfortunately it's just because of the way that the basically how bureaucracy works and things we have to do it under yeah. under wraps basically but i mean i guess people could guess i'm not, not going to push you too hard but i'm saying if you just went onto your youtube <laughs> youtube page there'd only be a few options there people could probably guess roughly we only have so many species so yeah it's we've the, not to say anything but we've also bred more frogs this year we were in the the paper about the first time a blue uh, a more frogs gone blue in britain for 700 years yeah. Um, yeah. and um, yeah we bred more frogs for the first time this year and they're going to go to basically re-establish more captive populations within the uk to hopefully Build and we've been doing some work with some researchers. This is all I'm going to say at this point. We've been doing some work with some researchers on the moor frog and looking at suitability of habitat in the UK. So that's it. You know, after that, I'm not saying yeah. any more. Okay, we, we, I don't. I won't put you there, but I, I kind of want to linger on the moor frogs just for a second because are are they completely gone out of the wild in the UK? And as has it actually been? I'm going to just throw a bunch of questions, and you, one of you guys can go. A, are they completely gone from the UK? B was it actually 700 years ago that they were beginning to get wiped out? I think that's the other thing that, especially in North America, we don't we don't think is that a lot of this urbanization in the in Britain happened hundreds of years ago. Where for us, it really it really is everything is so recent that it's it's hard to imagine that. And then the third thing is maybe you could talk about why they actually go blue and what's going on there. So yes, they are actually extinct. In yeah, the world, unfortunately. In the UK. But are they are they wild anywhere? Yeah, yeah, in yeah. Europe. So they're, they're, okay. they're good populations in Europe. Now, the problem you have with herps and reptiles is if anyone's ever seen a skeleton of a lizard or a snake or a frog, the bones are like splinters. You know, they're, they're really hard. So a lot of this evidence is based on, you know, a few fossils just because of chance. A mammoth was found in Sussex, I think it was a couple of years ago. And this is, you think about how big a bloody mammoth is, you know, five tons or whatever, huge. 
And that pushed the existence of mammoths a further 10,000 years into the future. Now, that's a mammoth. Now, think about a tree frog, which is two inches long. Now, you know, the chances of you yeah. finding fossils are absolutely nil. I mean, no one's looking for them either. No, yeah. and that's who the problem. No archaeologist yeah. saw, is going out saying, let's go find well, some tree think, frog birds. Think of one person who does, but that's it. Yeah. You know, there's just not many people who are doing it. So it's really hard. The concrete evidence of the moor frog, for instance, is we've got fossils from the fens from a few sites, knowing that they were in, in Norfolk and uh, Lincolnshire and places. And then there are also some historical references. There's a historical reference that says, talks about rana polystris, which in Latin means frog of the moors. So that's how we know that the moor frog was here in the 13th century as well. So it probably survived into the 15th century. Um, but it, after the 16th, that's when nature writers come about and they would have written about it. Now I haven't actually checked the research but I've got a good friend who, who does has done all of that and has not come across anything past the 13th century. So what I say is a safe bet is 13th or 14th century for extinction of the moor frog. And basically the reason why is the, the common frog. We, we, we have two species of frog in the UK. One, the pool frog is incredibly rare. It's only found in a few ponds. And two, the common frog. The common frog is very accommodating of fish ponds, garden ponds, ephemeral ponds, puddles. It can live kind of anywhere. The moor frog needs very, very large interconnected areas of wetland. Now, in the UK, we started draining our wetlands with the Romans 2,000 years ago. For instance, what they used to do is a mare burn, whereby you just burn huge areas of reeds. So it, it's it's not hard to put two and two together that these species would have declined, you know, th hundreds if not thousands of years ago. So basically, all in all, it's very hard to you know ascertain when species went extinct. But at least we do know what is native and what's not. It's so crazy. We you, just in our minds, or at least in my mind, I associate wildlife destruction with sort of industrial revolution, everything happening in the last 80 years or so. It's just so, it's so strange to think that human activity, even as far back as the Romans, were obviously manipulating the landscape to the point where you could actually have species become extinct. Yeah. So for instance, um, George Monbiot, who is an amazing author and one of the founders of the rewilding movement in Britain, actually made an estimate that sheep in Britain, just sheep alone, the grazing impact of sheep from the Roman era onwards, have had more impact on wildlife and our environment than all of the industry ever wow. in Britain. Because just, just, if you think about it, wait there, a factory is on an area of land, right? But compared to a farm, a farm, a typical farm in the UK is 300 acres. It's a tiny footprint. Yes, factories, you know, produce emission and uh, produce emissions and pollution, but at least uh, it's it's it relatively concentrated. I'm trying to say without saying that we can, you know, industry is fine. Yeah, we're not, you know, carry on. We're not promoting factories. But. but if you look at land surface area, industry only covers about two percent of the UK's land surface area. 75% of the land service area in the UK is farming. So it's a direct impact on, on everything, you know, farming has. So agriculture globally is the leading cause of, of wildlife decline. And that's why, you know, uh, vegan diets and, um, and uh, vegetarian diets are becoming a lot more popular because of the fact that, you know, um, we, we are having such an impact from agriculture for me personally today i've had a vegan day just because you know I, i'd like to try and lower my impact on on the environment eat less meat and things so so yeah you know agriculture has just been a massive impact and and even the roman era we think that the romans were you know we think that they were yes obviously they didn't have technology as advanced as we did but they still had sheep and they still had large areas to graze and burn and chop down you know Farming, although it has evolved and we're much better at producing food than we are, you know, even 20 years ago, it was, it's still fundamentally the same thing, the, the idea that you chop down the forest, graze the sheep. It, do you know what I mean? And, and that has not changed since. So in the UK, it's mainly been farming, which has caused this horrendous decline in all metrics of life. 
Well, and that's the same in, in North America, too. The amount of farmland has just destroyed the soil. And, you know, that's where you're starting to see these pushes for rejuvenative, rejuvenate, reju- what's the word? Reju- Regenerate. You guys know what I mean. Agriculture. So you're using, you know, you're having cattle go to pasture and stomp on the land and, and turn the soil. So you're not just constantly cutting through the soil and putting salt as, as fertilizers and then the wind blows it away. And, and it'd be, I think they've said there's only like 50 years of soil left or something for, for yeah. planting farms which is just i mean that doesn't that's well. scary hey, can we dial back to the blue frogs how, how, yeah. How, yeah. What's, why do they go blue i think it's the males right yeah um sorry i'm stealing this stealing uh, Tom yeah. again um <laughs> basically we don't actually know why why it happens to some extent there's been a few publications on it but what it is it's a build-up of lymph in the i think it's in the blood i think it's in the blood and basically that gives the superficial appearance of them being blue. And there is shown that females prefer blue in, bluer individuals. There was a study that was done where they did model more frogs in the water and females went on average more to the blue frogs than they did brown frogs. So there is obviously some sexual selection going on. The problem is, and I don't know the latest research to date unfortunately, although we see blue, what do the frogs see? what colours do they see it's a bit like blue throats there's a very famous experiment where blue throats were covered in some were covered in a clear uh, like uh, I don't know clear sheen on the blue throat on on the the literal blue throat of the blue throat and then to stop the UV uh, radiation bouncing off and females were not attracted to those males at all even though to us as humans they look no different so we don't know. The other thing, interesting, although it's blue, it's a superficial blue because it kind of changes depending on the way, the angle of the frog. So it depends on the light. So sometimes the frog can look like dark purple, but then you turn it a bit to the light and it, wow, it goes blue because you can see it in the skin where it kind of, it's kind of where the lymph is obviously built up and creates this sheen effect. So it's not like, blue blue but it is blue it's yeah. weird to act you know to, to kind true of blue yeah exactly madonna that is a madonna yeah. song <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah it's it's kind of like a it's a weird it's, it's it's weird you know the fact that this frog does this and you see this blue frog and, and this is what we talk about engagement with the public you see this blue frog in a horrible wet springy day in britain and it takes you to the tropics you would never think that a blue frog would live in the uk and and as i say we we were in the news about that the fact that it was the first time that a a frog has gone blue in 700 years or whatever that's a great headline by the way i mean talk about grabbing people's attention (laughs) and and people who responded and got in touch said you know it's 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 really fascinating i never knew this species existed thank you for shedding a light on it so it, it it's it's quite amazing, really, and we'd love to see with some of the rewilding initiatives taking place in East Anglia, like Wild East, in the Somerset Levels, which is an area of once vast wetland, used to be a wetland, um, that there are some areas where they're being rewilded, like Somerset Wildlands, and it would be amazing to bring these frogs back into these wild areas again. Um, you know, as, as I said, in, interconnected wetlands, large areas of reeds, lots of ponds and pool systems, and lakes, you know, bringing back this wildlife. And and, and it, again, the blue frog, the moor frog, fits in nicely with the other species which have gone, like the elk. You know, we're talking about elk require uh, wetland habitats. And not only the elk, but Britain also used to have pelicans. We used to have the Dalmatian pelican in the UK. I think you've got pelicans in Canada. Oh, yeah, they're all over the place, yeah. Really? Pelicans, oh yeah, they're everywhere. It's yeah, it's funny because they're even in the cities. Because we, I have a big river that flows through my city, and yeah, the pelicans are. There's probably some pelicans just outside right now. That's that's bonkers, and you know this is a species which we hunted out. We don't have any pelicans left in the UK. Do people eat pelicans? They used to, yeah, and I think, I think that's because some fossils have been found with with dentition cut marks on the bone. And to be honest, they don't. I'd eat one. They look pretty. If I was a Neolithic farmer, I think I'd eat one. You know, massive, big duck with a with a bucket on its face. You know, <laughs> I'd eat it. It'd be nice. Get some spring rolls on the go, a bit of spring onion. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't sound that bad. Probably tastes like chicken. 
<laughs> Preaching the wrong message here. Yeah, if we reimpose <laughs> pelicans, please do not go out and eat them. I- yeah, head to Celtic Reptile for their pelican recipe. <laughs> I was talking. To, I was. Talking, it was Pete Cooper actually. I was saying. I said because it was on the Beaver release, and I was saying, do you know what? Apparently, beaver is supposed to taste absolutely delicious, and I'm there. You know, I'm giving a complete wrong impression here. Talk. Complete wrong impression. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, and, and also the, talking about the beaver, the beaver as well in these vast in, interconnected wetlands. So, you know, it, it fits in as the same. But when Tom made the comment about rewilding, it fits into this larger narrative, which is about holistic nature conservation and restoring you know, large areas of land. You know, itself isn't rewilding, but it does fit yeah. within rewilding. And it's, it's, not, it's not all flashy, like blue frogs and massive yeah. mammals. You know, that's what we're trying to bring to light. Yes, we've got blue frogs, but we've also got frogs that are grey and dull, and we've got lizards that are grey and dull. It's not all these ama- amazing colours and tropical-looking species. It's... It's just the, the groundworks that we're also working with that are just as important. Yeah. You know, and, it's, and it's not on appearance, it's definitely on functionality. Yeah, and I, and I don't want to touch on this because I know we touched on it in the last podcast, but, you know, this is all about food. Restoring these species allows, you know, these animals to literally be eaten by pelicans, for instance, so that we make the ecosystem more functional. It's about what's known as trophic diversity, the idea that there are more Burger Kings, McDonald's, supermarkets, literally in nature, obviously not those fast food chains, but there are more opportunities for animals to eat and thus enrich the environment in which they live. It's a game of food. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think, I mean, I'm very optimistic. I think people even just general population are are headed this way as well they want to see see more nature i think there's a large point of mental health issues that are just related to living in a city like i I truly do believe living in a city kills people because you're just you're not connected with nature at all you're constantly surrounded by noise whether that's electrical noise or actual noise and light and it's just a, a really horrible setting so people go to the country and you feel so much more relaxed and i think we're going to start recognizing that that we need more nature in our life. Maybe we could wrap up with some of the, you guys have both kind of touched on it a little bit, but the disease control that you require at the facility. So maybe Tom, maybe you could run through, at least I know that for sure there's a fence that out, out aligns the entire facility. Maybe we could start with the fence and what the purpose of the fence is and then go from there. So there's what's known as a, a biological nuke fence. So it's certified. It's been installed by ecologists. So we know it's all proper and working. And it's, it's quite a simple thing, really. It's it's a polythene sheet that goes up to... I don't know how, how exactly high it is, about... 80 centimetres. Yeah, isn't that high that enough way. so that frogs, lizards, snakes can't get up and over. And newts, as... Well, it's it's called a newt fence, so it's going to stop newts. It's funny. I just want to stop you there for one second. As you guys know, uh, we were going to record this podcast a couple of weeks ago, so I have my notes from last time, but my, my writing is so bad that I don't re- I can't read my own writing you know, days later or weeks later, like it, I would have known what it said a month ago, but now I'm looking at it and it says <laughs> on my notes, it says neat fence. And I'm like, <laughs> and I knew that there was a cool fence, but now I'm realizing, yeah, it was newt fence, <laughs> it, which is a neat fence as well, but it's designed for newts. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's basically to stop wild amphibians and reptiles getting into our facility and transmitting disease. So in the wild, there are diseases, obviously, amongst uh, the reptiles and amphibians. And if they come into contact with our captive populations, then they can transmit the disease. And then if we ever go to do releases in the future, it will mean that we can't do them because they've got the disease. So, And it works both ways as well. If animals ever somehow get out of our facility, and in, they can't get out into the wild then because the fence stops them so it stops transmission both ways which is important really and then also leaning on from that we have foot dips on the entrance of the site so anyone entering has to bleach their shoes and well whatever's on the feet in this solution which kills all the bacteria and disease off so don't turn up in flip flops (laughs) yeah we've we've done that a few times Um, and then you walk over a fence which 
is another fence, which is an electric fence, which yeah. stops predatory animals getting in, like foxes and badgers and things and like that. And not wolves or bears, although I'd love to be able to defend <laughs> yeah. the facility. I don't think it would withstand that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that protection as well, which is just as important. And then we've got um, things like hand san- sanitizers, which is everywhere. I mean, that worked wonders with COVID and having like photographers and that come to the site we've already got hand sanitizers everywhere so that that sort of and the whole and COVID gloves situation too. Yeah. so you know the main diseases that we're on about here are chytrid fungus and rana virus and there's a few other diseases which are nasty and nitrile kills chytrid for instance so nitrile gloves literally kill chytrid oh, wow. so we've got boxes of those literally everywhere and these little hand sanitizer stations where we've got a sticker that says sanitize now like to everyone who comes in it's like chanel because one of the problems we'd have is is that we'd like go from one enclosure and i'd go oh bug it you know left the hand sanitizer back in the office and have to walk out foot dip go over an electric fence try and not sting my bollocks as i'm trying <laughs> to climb over this fence you know to go back into the office to go and grab it to then go foot dip again try and not electrocute myself as i go over the fence and back to where i was and then i've forgotten what i was doing i've lost my tools whatever so what we did was is we put just everywhere loads of these stations where we've got um hand sanitizer holders just just everywhere with stickers saying sanitize hands so we've always got you know hand sanitizers on, on on hand and then with the foot dips as tom said there's one on the entrance but also within the facility so there's one before you go into the greenhouse there's one before you go into the tadpole area just to stop transmission on you know the soles of our feet uh, well not our literal feet on the soles of our shoes well, and if, if you're wearing flip yeah so. if you're wearing flip flops um, and uh, it's all just because you know we need to be as biosecure as possible and it's something we need to take incredibly seriously because you know even from a human perspective with the covid pandemic you know diseases are a real threat to life so it's something that we take incredibly seriously and on top of that we do polymerase chain reaction tests which are whereby you uh, swab the animal and then the dna is uh, the dna of that pathogen is sequenced and to see if it's in that animal and if so it's isolated and that goes without saying we have standard qu- quarantine procedures um, and all of this is outlined it will be public eventually but all of this is outlined in a biosecurity protocol that we had written for us by zookeepers uh, wildlife vets um, disease consultants but a great group of people wrote us this biosecurity protocol um, and that's basically up on the wall and that's what we use as a standard um, standard practice for the for the animals and it's also within that document is standard practice for zoos especially um, um, what is it I think it's ZSL zoos so ZSL Whipsnade and ZSL uh, London London Zoo both use some of the practices because it was some of their publications which we use for the uh, biosecurity protocol so standard you know zoo practice we will be as biosecure hopefully as a zoo you know hopefully so basically what we're saying is you can't really do it in your bedroom yeah it's hard and this is where it comes about space because (laughs) you need you need space for instance we're having a unit put in whereby it's a sink it's a it's separated from the area from the other area it's a sink and it's a storage unit so that we can store all of the um disease all of the um disinfectants and solutions and powders and and we've got this sink so everything can be disinfected away from the facility um it's a nightmare but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's nightmare, a necessity but it is a necessity yeah. but goes without saying again we use standardized um uh, disinfectants like F10 F10 is amazing stuff um, as well as an agricultural um, disinfectant called Vircon and uh, that's used on foot dips and things so yeah it's all to maintain it and also we've got signage up saying like biosecurity protocols in place please adhere by you know instructions um, and that sort of thing and uh, and yeah of course the, 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 the best biosecurity protocol ever is to not keep animals but obviously that defeats the object of you know <laughs> of keeping reptiles and amphibians so you know it's all about just, just knowing that you're doing the best that you can do and uh, that's exactly what we're doing yeah yeah so if, if you were to move forward with some rewilding will is the government would they require you to prove like have, show PCR tests for each animal that's going out and make sure everything's clean or like will, will somebody follow up with you guys on your biosecurity measures 
Potentially, yeah. So yeah. it's just best practice at the end of the day. And, um, you know, for any reintroduction of success, it's best to have animals which are disease free. So, you know, it, it, it's not, and even if it wasn't a requirement, and even if we wouldn't get followed up, it's just, you, we know that it's a threat and we know that, you know, it needs to be tackled. So therefore, you know, it's the right thing to do anyway. You don't want to learn the hard way. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and it probably will save us money in the long run because with having these very strict protocols twinned with using advancing, keeping a proper diet, ultraviolet light, etc., um, you lower the mortality rate and vet bills and things. So it's it's good. And, and this is where we did actually put a little social media push out maybe a couple of months ago where we were talk- we wrote our biosecurity protocol, very simplified, but so that everyone could understand. And we were urging everyone who can to implement a biosecurity protocol within their captive collections, maintain aseptic technique, maintain blocks, do quarantine, do tests, take your animal to the vet, because you know we don't want any more you know nasty pathogens like chytrid getting out into the wild so you know anyone who's listening and keeps their animals and is and is interested there are lots of online resources and stay tuned on the celtic website because we're going to have a biosecurity we did have a biosecurity page but we're redoing it at the moment and it's going to have what we do on so you can look for inspiration there but just maintain good hygiene you know it, it's a no-brainer it's useful for commercial commercial breeders as well yeah like we've mentioned um reduces mortality and commercial breeders are like the stem of captive populations obviously as they're yeah. breeding the animals so if we can stop disease there then we can stop it hopefully everywhere in captive supply and then rewilding would be a much easier thing because places like or like our facility would be able to get more captive stock that we know doesn't have disease and doesn't have all these issues that a lot of captive stock does have so it's beneficial to everyone yeah 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 i don't think any of the i mean as far as i know any of the big commercial breeders that seemingly don't have much of a biosecurity protocol so it would be nice to implement some of that what about birds do you guys have to worry about birds are birds an issue do you have predatory birds that could grab your animals or anything like that yeah so there are there was a buzzard actually over the facility the other day do you have buzzards by the way, in Canada. Like, are those just, um, like, vultures? Or is buzzard a <laughs> No, we don't have vultures. <laughs> we had a vulture come from the Alps, actually, and it stayed not far away from where we are now. And, like, there were thousands of people turned up to photograph a vulture, and they're really common in France and places. Oh, know. yeah, yeah. We have these things called turkey vultures. They're a type of vulture, but I, I, I don't know. No, I don't. What, what is a buzzard? We might have them. It might be a different. Tiny way. vulture. Uh, yeah, it's... it's, it's uh, <laughs> Buzzards are a member of the eagle family, but they're much smaller than a golden eagle, let's say. Okay. And um, they're like ju- a hawk or something. Yeah, basically a hawk. Yeah. yeah big, okay. Yeah, we got tons of those. Like a one meter wingspan. That's the size. Yeah. So we get a lot of buzzards flying over. We sometimes get a kestrel. You have kest- American yeah. kestrels, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so we do have to have our eyes open. The number one thing is crows because crows are incredibly intelligent. Now, I don't know if you've seen um, Garden State Tortoise, just remembered it. He did a great video on predator proofing and he was actually uh, a lot of... He, I've not spoken to him personally, but that video was a lot of help with informing choices with predator deterrence within the facility. Um, and um, you know, he says crows can come down and eat the eggs from the turtle while they're being laid. And they're just an absolute nuisance. So the way that we stop that is we tried a method whereby we put fishing wire up and around on top, creating this like net, and it absolutely did not work. It just <laughs> fell apart, blew away in the wind, it was a nightmare. I nearly strangled myself to death, you know, it was just like horrendous. You show up the next day, Harvey's stuck in the net. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it caught me and not a crow. But... <laughs> So at the end of the day, we're actually going to do it, I think, today. We're just, uh, in a min, we're just going to go and put some netting over the top of the enclosures or whatever and, and yeah. just do that. But also, not just birds eating the animals, also birds transmitting diseases as well. So within the biosecurity yeah. protocol, there's a bit where it says about, you know, a bird could go into the enclosure, 
you know, get soil on its feet and go out. Now the risk of that is incredibly minimal, but it's a risk and it's easy, yeah. easily amendable with a bit of mesh over the top of an enclosure. So that's what we'll do, you know, at the end of the day. And uh, and yeah, it's always, and that's the thing about it is, is you, with these projects, you can never go in and go, you know, we're going to win. It's going to be perfect and we're never going to have any mistakes. You know, you've got to realise that some things don't work and you've got to change. You know, no one is stupid for making a mistake so long as that mistake is not made twice or three times, you know, it, it, it's it's just, you've just got to learn and adapt and evolve to, you know, the times, really. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I think we've covered a lot here. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you guys wanted to mention before we wrap up? Um, not Nothing comes to mind. No, I don't think so, no. no. Are there any future things that people can watch for on the YouTube channel or anything? Do you guys have anything in the works that way? Yeah, well, we could just address the YouTube thing. As I said earlier, you know, it's just been, because we've been building the facility, we haven't been able to focus solely on the YouTube channel. But hopefully, um, come, we've got some exciting news hopefully coming this autumn. Uh, we're going to be doing some cool stuff on the YouTube channel. And then on top of that, um, next year we're going to try and, you know, really up the content on the YouTube channel. So we kind of been we've been slacking but it's because we've been doing other things you know it's hard to film a facility with youtube when the facility isn't built <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, i just thought so as well keep an eye open for that yeah and oh go ahead tom i was just gonna say uh we've we've done some work on our website and we've now got merch basically which is something that ah, might, yeah. might interest. Yeah. Um, it's all sustainable as well. Someone out there, yeah. It's all sustainable merch. So using recycled materials um, and biodegradable materials and organic, you know, um, cotton. I think we used yeah. in the design. So if people want to check that out and and buy some of the clothes, uh, the money goes into maintaining excellent care of these animals. And uh, thank you if you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anybody looking to support their project, go go buy a shirt. I think that's and a Patreon. Good way to do it. Or Patreon. If, yeah. if you don't like the clothes, then. Um, What's that? If, if you don't like the, the, our fashion, <laughs> you can always join on Patreon and help okay. us out that way. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make sure the Patreon and, and the, the shirts are in the and the websites in the show notes as well to make sure that people can support if they're interested in supporting. And if they aren't wanting to financially support, just watching the YouTube videos and sharing the YouTube is a great way to, to help support as well if you're, if you're not in the position to financially support. Well, I think we should probably do a, another podcast next year, come back in yes. a year and see, because I can't imagine where you guys are going to be in another year from now, considering how much you got done this year. So I think we'll wrap this episode up here. Thank you both very much for the work you're doing, as well as spending the time with me this afternoon. Thank you. No worries. It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Can you let everybody know where they can find the website and the YouTube channel as well, just in case they don't know? So just YouTube, just type in Celtic Reptile and Amphibian and we'll come straight up. And then with the, the website, it's www.celticreptileamphibian.co.uk and uh, it'll come up and, and you can yeah. contact us on there if you wish and, and uh, have a look at some of the stuff on there. I will say it's a bit of a work in progress because we've uh, had to revamp the website since we had the media explosion. So. Um, some bits are not working and some bits are not thingy but most of the primary stuff is there so people can and we're doing it ourselves and we're no we're, we're not by all means good no at website <laughs> design so bear with us on that yeah. one there's a learning curve with everything but thank you guys very much this was a pleasure thanks no yeah, thank you it's been great thank you very much all right, that is the end of that episode. Harvey and Tom, thank you so much for spending the afternoon with me. That was an excellent conversation. Like I said, I can't imagine where you're going to be in a year from now. So we'll definitely have to have a 2022 update. You guys have been on fire this whole time. So it's a very exciting time for you guys. And I can't wait to see how those projects evolve. I would love to see the day where you guys actually are involved in having new species being added to the wild habitats. That will be incredible. I'm sure you're excited for that day as well. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you're looking for anything that we mentioned in today's episode, any of the links and whatnot, make sure you head to the show notes. Everything is there for you. That's at animalsathomenetwork.com. Again, if you'd like to join us over at Patreon, head to patreon.com slash animalsathome. And thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Again, affiliate links are both in the YouTube description as well as the show notes. I think that is it for today. I will catch you guys next Sunday.